Welcome back for part two of the Peace River Fossil Hunt Adventure. Today I'm going to identify some of the shark's teeth that we found. I'm going to show you a really great fossil identification book that I love. And I'm going to introduce you to bead embroidery so that you can see what some of those amazing shells turned into and how I did it. Thanks for coming along and enjoy. First up, let's talk about the shark's teeth. And we are back at the jewelry bench, getting ready to do some new exciting things that I haven't shared with you guys in videos yet before. We're gonna go over beading and we're gonna talk a little bit about fossils. Now, as you know, we picked a, a bunch of fossil teeth up when we were at the Peace River. And we have what appears to be, to my eye at least, four different types. And they all have something a little bit different about them. Let me put them on this light colored background maybe and you can see them a little bit better. Hopefully this is focusing. You can see these guys. Now you also notice that I have them sitting next to yet another book, which is another one of my books in my Let's ID Stuff arsenal. This is a really cool book by a guy who's a paleontologist out of Charleston. His name is Ashby Gale. And then Bob and Pam are his parents. And one of them is like the cataloger and the organizer, and the other one is uh, good at photography and then he's the as the son is the paleontologist so they put this field guide together and it is wonderful i'm just going to show you how this book is set up all right identification first section is shark's teeth and then you've got other areas that have to do with the you know the foot bones, another area the book will have to do with, uh, let's see what this one is, mouth parts. So this is what you call a field guide, and you can see these little different colors right here on the edges. The section that we are interested in today is the section on the shark's teeth, so we can identify the little specimens that I have pulled out here. Now, identifying things from books is not necessarily uh, 100% exact especially if your little tooth is broken i am a barely informed amateur i am not an expert at this stuff but i'm pretty good at looking at the photographs of what we have and seeing what looks like it matches so for our first little fellow that's up right here this guy right here i think looked just like this that is what's called extant. It's not extinct. It means that uh, the animal still lives in some form or fashion today, maybe originally where it was located, maybe in a different part of the world. And we come across this with certain shells sometimes. We don't have them anymore here in the States, but they still actually exist out in Indonesia, for example. So this first guy that we have up is an extant thresher shark, Alopius bulpinus. And he's got that nice little high ridge over here. You could see this part of the tooth broke, like right about there. That's part of where the root is. Has that little curve, no serrations on it. So my best guess is that that one is from a thresher shark. All right. So the second one we have up on the list. Oh, we got to go past the third one. I guess maybe I should just reorder that so that he is second. That would make my life easier. <laughs> All right, next up, a favorite for this area. Hemipristis, an extinct snaggletooth shark. Now, this doesn't necessarily look like your typical hemi because 
and that's what they go by. Everybody calls them Hemi's. This is what a, a Hemi Princess Sarah different tooth from up in the uh, the top. These bigger teeth up here with the serrations, that's the form that most people know. And they have that little wave in them, so there's a little divot in there in the front of them. This guy is from the lowers. So I'm gonna lay him on the plate, the page. Hopefully he'll be able to sit kind of like this one is so that you can see it. It's got a uh, interesting curve to it, that big knob kind of right there. And I'm not sure if you can see it this close up on this camera, but there are actual serrations along the side of that tooth. That's what makes it a Hemi. So there's number two on our list. The third little fellow was a little harder. He sort of looks like a lemon, but he's not in the shape of a T. He's more in the shape of a Y. And his blade is a little shorter. I believe this one to be a bull shark. Also extant, not extinct. So if this one is from a bull shark, the Carcanhenus lucas. Oh God, I'm butchering these names, I'm sure of it. But the blade is a little shorter, a little wider. Got a little bit of a different kind of thing going on here at the borlet and the little wings that go up on it that you can see here on the ends. So I do believe this fella is a bull shark. And then last up, we have the lemon shark, Negaprion brevirostris. Distinctive T shape to the tooth, comes down to a nice little point. I mean, that's that guy right there, spot on. So that one is from a lemon shark. Half the fun of finding fossils is to try to figure out what it is that you actually found. And it's not that easy sometimes to find uh, great information out there. Listen, I'm not an affiliate marketer. I don't get paid if you buy this book. I. Uh, all I want to do is just share that I think it's a fantastic book and let you make your own decisions on if you want to invest in any fossil identification information. But this fella, being out of Charleston, gets a hold of teeth from all over. Megalodons and Angustodons, which is the precursor to them. Uh, he finds some pretty amazing stuff up there. And he's done beachcombing from North Carolina all the way down to Florida to make this guide. So I just thought I would share this book with you. I think it's fantastic. I use it all the time and uh, yeah just great the way it's set up and I'm just gonna flip through this so you can see you'll see all different sorts of things in here not just from sharks either all different sorts of fossils here's a popular one around this area right here stingray mouth plates we find these guys all over the place There's another one we can find around here from a glyptodon. It's one of the body armor plates. These are osteoderms from an armadillo. So these types of things are some of what we find in our fossil record around here. So many of the things that you see in this book, oh, there's some garfish scales right there. Many of the things that you see in here are things that you would actually find on our, our beaches or going fossil hunting here in Bone Valley. So just thought I'd share that book with you. Enjoy it. Well, for these little beauties, my little freshwater mussels, after digging around a little bit online, because I couldn't find them in any of my, you know, ocean-going shell books, being that they're a freshwater mussel, I came up with this. Um, brown exterior, iridescent interior, a Florida shiny spike. So I thought that was pretty cool, too. It's about the shape that we have right there, actually. You can see that ridge through the middle and a little one there, too. And that is actually, even though we've taken all the uh, brown stuff off of them, you can see the ridge line there and the ridge line there. And the really nice coppery iridescence on that. So that is called a shiny spike. And I think if I see more of these, I'm going to grab them. I cannot 
get over those colors. Make sure I'm under the light so you can see that. Isn't that gorgeous? Golds and greens and pinks and aqua blues. Oh, just so pretty. So, as I mentioned before, I was going to do some embroidery around these. And to start that off, I'm going to have to attach them to this backing. So that's what I'm going to do next. You're probably wondering why I've put this book on top of these fairly delicate shells. And that is because I want to make sure they're well bonded to the background material so that I can go ahead and stitch around them without worrying about them coming off at all. And to do that, and I'm, I won't do it on this shell because I've already glued those four now, but what I did was run the glue around this outside edge and further up in. When you set that down like that, that glue is going to slump down the sides, still clinging to the shell and now spreading onto your background a little bit. So it'll make a nice bond in there. Part of the reason for using the uh, paint mixture that I do for my beaded background is so that there's a, a nice surface there between that and the pellon for the glue to adhere to. I'm not a huge fan of E6000 glue, like at all. Number one, it smells really bad and number two if you read the msds sheets it's a little scary to work with and i don't like a lot of fumes inside uh so yeah i try to stick to things that don't have any fumes my trusty gorilla glue which i love so that is what we've got going on there in about 30 seconds that'll be cool enough for us to pick up and start stitching <laughs> So you can see now that I have a, a bunch of different beads pulled out. Some of my containers are a little beat up. Um, I have this collection of just neutral colored stuff that I use with a lot of my little beachy style projects that I do for seed beading. Um, I tried to pull stuff that sort of sets off these colors that you see shimmering in these shells. Um, for my eye, which I don't think it shows properly on camera under this lighting, maybe if I get closer. No, not really. You can see little flashes of blue-greens and pinks in there. There's some copper and some pearl and some dark gray. So what I tried to pull was things that would complement and go with that. And I, I pulled this one, but I don't think I'm going to keep it. It's a little too gold-toned, I think. This is, to me, this is cooler colors when I look at it. So I, I don't think it's going to end up being with this. And I'll do that. I'll pull a bunch of colors, and I'll put things back, and I'll try something else. I really don't need very many beads, honestly, because I'm not going to be doing a whole lot around these. These coppery-colored ones. I think look nice. So I'm going to put these at the top with these little Zolly duos on either side and then go around like in a little line. Anyway, that's the plan. Alright, so I sort of have a little bit more picked out here and a 
little more to show you. I moved the camera angle so you can look kind of straight down at things. All right, these beads here are called Zolly Duels. Z O L I D U O S. Zolly Duos. Well, it's hard to spit that out. And they come handed, left or right handed. And I thought, combined with this little thing here, and then I've got these for like two little eyes. I thought this looked like a little hermit crab kind of peeking out from behind the shell, and I thought it was really cute. So that's what I'm going to do with these. I'm going to bead that on there and then go around in a line and then put a little hanger at the top so that you can hang them off of hearing findings. And uh, then they'll be backed with ultra suede. The thread I am partial to is called KO. Um, it's a colored version of what they call Sono thread. It's a little hard to get the spool started. Once you get that out of there. And I'm going to pull off a length about as long as my arm, probably. Just so I have an, make sure I have enough to go all the way around and complete this thing. And there we go. I also always take the thread and see how there's a, a curve to it. I don't know if that's showing up on camera, if it's dark enough to see it. But you can see there's the, the shape of the, the spool throughout it. So I just take it in between my thumbnail and my finger and just sort of try to go opposite of that. And sort of pull some of that out. Yeah, that's a little better. And I do that because if you leave it all curly like that, it'll want to twist up on you when you're working. And it'll make things a little more difficult. Alright, so now that I have a, a rough plan here of where I'm going. Now, if you're already a beater and you do this, your first instinct might be to cut this apart. But I'm going to leave them together so that I can make sure things are lined up on the same sides, same spots for a matching mirror book and match kind of a, an effect. So the easiest way to do that for me is I'm just going to leave both these pieces on here. have our little Sully Duo beads here that are making his little claws. This little cup looks like his shelly's peeking out of. 
and then his two little eyes right there. Now I'm going to go around just like this and then a smaller line around there and then I'll make a loop up here. You can see that I have the needle coming out right at the bottom of the point of the little hermit crab's legs and that's where I wanted to come out. And I'm just going to add few of these beads on here. Chasing this one here. And I like to go like four or five at a time. And then back stitch through them. So that means I'm gonna go down right here as the thread exits that last bead. Then I want to come back up through between the first and second ones I just added, right here. And I'm going to go through two center ones. And back down in. And I'm going to come here between the center two again. I'm going to pass my needle through these first two. Snug everything up a little bit and then add some more and repeat the process all the way around until I get to here.
there we have it. We have our layers of beads around the center shell. We have a cute little hermit crab guy there. So sweet. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking it might be a little bit big for an earring. So I think I would rather, in this case, make these necklace pendants. So this little guy is going to hang like this. And then the, the hanger will be right there for the earring hook. And since I'm making a necklace out of it, I could add some fringe or whatever to it as well, actually. But that will come in the next step when we uh, attach the backing and put the edging on. Now, I can make this one match. It's just that, I don't know, this, this gives me a sense it might be a little big. I don't know. I'm going to hold off judging until I get them both beaded, and then I trim around them and back them and edge them. And if at that point I think it's too big for earrings, then I'll just have two necklace pendants instead. As you can see, I've got the rows of beading now around our centerpiece. Their little hermit crab fella up there. Isn't he cute? And what I want to do now is back this piece. And I'm going to do that by putting it onto a piece of ultra suede. And I'm going to just glue it down. Um, what I'm going to use is this. Aileen's. Just a, a white PVA glue. I don't want anything too thin that will soak through this or soak through the ultra suede and stain it. So I'm going to put a piece of, or a little bit of glue around here. I'm going to avoid the edge because I'm going to be stitching this to this and putting a beaded edge around it. That's what's going to hold it together here at the edges so I don't have to go all the way to the edge with the glue. If I do that, it'll make it a lot harder to get the needle through it once it's dry. So I'm going to go ahead and glue this to the ultra suede. And then I'm going to set it aside to dry. And then once I have it edged and have my little hook on the top, my little beaded loop on the top, then I'm going to decide whether or not I want to make earrings or necklace pendants out of these guys. You'll notice that I trimmed very, very close to the edge. You see there's not very much there showing. There doesn't need to be. There doesn't need to be this big, bold line of just backing foundation around my piece. I want the beaded edge from attaching this to this to be right up next to these beads. That's why I trim it close like that. So you need to make sure when you're stitching around and then trimming that you don't nick any of the threads, that you don't cut off your working uh, thread or anything like that, and uh, go from that point there. But yep, that's how it's looking so far. It's coming out really, really cute. <laughs>
working my way around now. Uh, we've made a little progress around here. You actually can see this beautiful little sparkly silver border. These are small bead. These are an eight, that's an 11, and that's a 15 knot. And uh, they, they go a little even tinier than that, but uh, as you can tell as I'm putting them on the needle, the needle is very thin, the bead is pretty small. Hopefully you can see that on there, and that's what's making the edging. And the reason for having a neutral thread is so that you don't have a big bold line of stitch work here on the back too. This tan sort of just kind of fades into this brown a little bit and the, with the silver next to it. And remembering also that this is the back of the piece and nobody's going to be looking at it, but um, yeah. And that's why we've trimmed so close to the edge. See, we just see the barest little hint of that custom-made bead foundation back through there, picking up the silver in this along the edging. And the beads sit right over that seam in between the two of them and stitch the two of them together. So once I get the rest of the way around here, I'll go all the way around that. And at the top, I will bead a loop that I can attach a jump ring to to turn this into either earrings or a pendant. A little progress check here. I've made it most of the way around the outside edge now. Just got a little bit more at the top there to do. And as I'm on my way around, when I get to here, I'll make my loop and then keep going. Okay, we're getting to the last little bit here and I'm almost back at where I started. <clears throat> so we'll go through how to join those up. I, I don't think I can fit another bead in there. So rather than try to force one, I will take and bridge over to the first one I put down, which was this one here. Go down through that. Oh, boy. After a couple hours of this, my eyes don't want to work great. Goodness gracious. Okay, just like that. I'm going to go back through. And then I'm just going to weave this through a little bit. All that means is going back through some of the other existing beads. And then once I'm done the weaving through, I will go ahead and finish this off and this piece will be complete. There's the one I wanted to go through. And there. And that'll be more than enough to keep the edge secure. And then just to reinforce where the earring or pendant piece is going to go right here. The jump ring is going to go right here. I'm going to add a little bit of GS Hypo Cement to this whole ring of beads just to solidify it. But there we have it. Cute little hermit crab pendant. Very sweet. Back the next day and I put a little dab of glue on this guy to make his eyes a little more shiny and sparkly. Hopefully that shows on the camera. And a little reinforcing here for the loop at the top. So, I personally think this is a teeny bit too big for earrings. Uh, I like big jewelry, but even if, if I think it's too big for earrings, then it must be because I like bigger jewelry than most people. So I think I'm going to make a necklace pendant out of this guy. And I'm going to make a matched one that goes with, just like as if I was making earrings. I'm going to go ahead and put the little hermit crab over here on this side and do something around here the same as what I did for this one and then I'll have two necklaces instead of a pair of earrings gosh I just can't get over how pretty these are how beautiful that pink and blue and green flash and that iridescence just stunning I mean for just an ugly little brown muscle I mean 
it, it's amazing. It's like there was buried treasure buried under the, the outer layer of the shell itself. Pretty cool. Alright, did this one up in some different colors since it's going to be pendants and not earrings. Really like it with this little blue and that pink picking up those colors that you see reflected in the shell itself. I really think that's cute. So now I'm going to trim around this and we'll go ahead and put it on ultra suede and back it like we did the other one and put an edging around it. And this time instead of this fancier smaller bead edging which is a, a three bead pico edging basically. I am going to do a, a different style of edging around here where there's a, a flat, like a line, more or less. And uh, it'll look uh, quite a bit different than the other one when it's complete. But you'll see when we get to that point. First, now, what I need to do is trim around this. And remember I said with the other piece, you want to get right up close to the edge. And that's why these pieces of beading foundation don't need to be huge because you're not going to really... Um, you're not beating a huge expansive piece you just need something where the the color is consistent throughout now i'm going to start in here toward the bottom and you'll see i'm holding that thread out of the way because it's still a working thread and i don't want to cut it because i'm going to use it to start my edging so i'm going to just come up close to the edge here and i don't know if you can see that i'm leaving that little bit around there And again, you don't need to leave a lot of space around this piece. There's plenty of material there to sew into. Slip that off like that. Now, that's kind of a little tight bit of a spot. So I might actually have to come in with different approach, different side, just to get that little piece out of there. And see, now it's going to fit right around there. Continue on around.
And now it's probably becoming kind of clear why it is that I make my uh, backgrounds custom matched and neutral so that if some of it does show, it blends with the shells and the bead piece. And there we go. Cut around the edge. All right, we've glued it down. Now I'm gonna go around and trim this edge. Being careful to keep my working thread out of the blade's way. This ultra suede cuts nice too. Very easy to get through. You just need good sharp scissors. Now, I'll just say it cuts easy, but it's a little tricky to get these little fine details cut in. And it's okay if you don't get that on something this small out of there. But what you don't want is you don't want the ultra suede being bigger than the actual piece. Because then when you stitch the edging, it's going to fold that fabric over and kind of get in the way and give you an uneven edge. So I try to make sure I've got it trimmed as, as tightly as I can, as close as I can, without a lot of extra showing along the sides to mess it up. time for me to admit that my eyes aren't as good as I think they are sometimes and I really I really noticed it and realized it while I was working on uh, this project here that even with my glasses I was still kind of having a hard time with the lights and seeing well and whatnot so I overnighted this crazy little stand thing from Amazon and it's it's a little weighted base this gooseneck thing and uh, that's that's what it says on it. I'm, again, I'm not an affiliate marketer. Um, it's just if you're interested and you like it, this, that's where I got it. Uh, it's a magnifying light stand. It's got all these little LEDs on the back here. And yeah, I have to admit, I don't have my glasses on right now. And I'm fairly impressed with 
you know, what's going on here. But thought I would show off these uh, completed projects and show you a few other pieces of embroidery so you can get an idea of just how far you can take it, actually, when you start doing it. It's a lot of fun. There's the first one. And I'm, I'm getting in with the magnifier here a little bit so that you can see a little Hermy on there. Isn't he sweet? There's a little bit of a lens light flare happening from this thing as I try to get in closer with the camera, but even without my glasses, I can see half decent, so this is kind of great. So here's the first one. Here's the second one. I'm going to hold them at a little different angle and see if that helps. <laughs> Looks like a neat special effect, but I'm <laughs> not trying to have it happen. It just is. But yeah, it does uh, does make things bigger and easier to see. And in contrast to the first piece, you can see this one is the single bead edging. So it makes for a, a thinner border. And it would be thinner still if I used the small beads like I made the loop on top out of. Next one is this beauty. Oh, I just love this one. That's my colors, my jam right there. And this time I used a, a lighter background, more of a, a silver sort of, kind of a silvery beige neutral. And uh, just tried a different finding on the top here. Hopefully uh, this will show. And that gives me a little metal piece that sort of matched up with the beads for me to sew through and attach a jump ring here for it. That crazy lens flare, sorry. But yeah, isn't that pretty with the blues and greens? There's four different colors of seed beads along this outside edge here on this one. All right, the shells I showed you are just a, a hint at some of the things you can do. And uh, I don't know if you noticed this one over here on this side. I have worn in a number of videos at this point. It's a top off of a crown conch, a broken crown conch that I found on the beach and I cut it on my tile saw to make the back flat, embroidered around it. You can see some little Zolly duos up there at the top. And then this really nice thick lush fringe that I do. Over here we have one in progress that is, uh, what do we have on here? We have a moon snail and we have a little baby whelk there and some button snails, some really old button snails and then a couple of chestnut turbans over here on the side. And this uh, shell naturally had a hole in it up here so I put a little uh, I don't know if you can see that on the camera or not. It's a little lucite flower as like a little cup kind of to fill that hole in, but would still allow me to pass needle back and force through it so that I could put some other fringe and dangly fun things. Oops. And you can see that that's still being beaded, that uh, I still have space down here. This is all gonna be done with the, the fringe and everything all around through there. And that thread is just my working thread. I have it just wrapped to the back and wrapped around the, the side of the piece. That's nothing that is part of that stitch line. I like the, uh, the punch of some of the pearlescent and shiny beads against the relatively matte finish on most of the shells. It's a nice contrast. So that's a piece in progress. This is uh, one of my favorites. I wear this all the time. I love this one. Just super pretty. And it's it's thick. I mean, it stands away from you. I'll try to show you a side view here. So you can see that that stands off of your chest by about an inch, inch and a quarter or so. So it has a lot of dimension to it. And here's something a little more complex, a little more artistry involved in this one. I have uh, this piece on the sides just flipped over to show you how it's backed with like a wine colored or chocolate colored rather ultra suede on the back. And these are slices of deer antler that I got. I forget where now. I've had them for years. But I beaded this to wear to a gallery opening for a Beat Society uh, gallery show that we did. 
It is uh, deer antler and crazy lace agate, the big uh, crazy lace agate cabochon there. With another large one down here. And I've uh, run some wire and things through the back so that I was able to attach chain and things like that to it. Uh, there's the centerpiece featuring the crazy lace agate, a number of uh, sizes and styles of seed beads, some keishi pearls, which are these cornflake looking almost pearls on here, and then some natural stone down here, some different jaspers around the bottom, and a more complex pico bead edge that stands away. And it's done with these little disc beads and some crystals rather than seed beads. You get a little more pronounced, and then you go down to the bottom section, and this is, the magnifier is distorting the shape a little bit. Here's another piece of crazy lace agate with the really big lush type fringe that I'm kind of known for. That fringe itself is what stands away from the piece, unlike the crown con. The fringe is what sticks out. And this necklace is pretty long. You wear it with like, like a long, simple, single colored dress. It's perfect for that. And with more of the stone around and the seed beads and the keishi pearls. And uh, I've got pieces that are even quite a bit larger than this. Uh, pieces that have been published and shown, different things like that. So uh, you, you can let your imagination run wild with bead embroidery. It's kind of a fun little technique to have in your arsenal as an artist.